guys. We just want to welcome you. We thank you so much for being here. It means the world to us, all of our family, friends, people from long ago, and people we just met. And we know that God is doing something amazing in this place. Um, we're starting from ground zero and ready to build something. Um, God's moving. And when Rick was like, I don't know, let me see the space. And God started opening up every single door. And it just, wow, okay, that worked out. And he brought these people into our life. He said, I'm going to pray for someone to lead our worship. And then there was Morgan. I mean, it's one thing after the next, friends and neighbors and, and people supporting us. And it's just been such a beautiful time. I'm so excited. It's such an honor to serve God. I would rather... There's nothing I would rather do in this world than be here and speaking to you. And I just thank you. And um, I ask that we say a little prayer to get started and ask for God's presence today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for providing the space, providing the strength and, and the wisdom and all the words that you give us that, that we don't even have ourselves. We just ask that you come and fill this place with your spirit. Just give Rick the words, the message that you would have him speak. Please be with everyone online and in person, all our family and friends out there. We love you, we appreciate you, and um, we're glad you're here with us, and um, we look forward to sharing with you many weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good job, worship with me. Oh, 
um, that you can write your name and put your information there. We are working with uh, PushPay and app, and we are going to be having an app next week with our straight up books. And you'll be able to get online, and you'll be able to uh, just follow us through there and connect with us. So we're excited about that because then it's it's a great thing to have. So we're going to do it old school today, and then next week we'll do it um, with push pay. Yeah, if you can take the envelopes, and then we'll come back, we'll pick them up later. We're going to lead into worship right now, and uh, I'm going to lead into a prayer. So we're going to go into a prayer. And I'll let you guys uh, do your thing in there. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for our first Sunday in Straight Up Church. Thank you for your support. Thank you for uh, just your blessings. You open every door, and we just uh, follow you in faith and work, and you are just providing. Lord, open us our heart, and let us be that cheerful giver. Uh, we don't see people just, you know, cheering when they're giving, right? They're always grouchy, but, you know, we, we need to outgive you, and, which is impossible, but you know, open up our hearts to make sure that, you know, there are hearts in the right place, and you know this church is going to be different, and we're going to help, help, help. We're not in competition here. We're in cooperation to just have a, a stronger church, a stronger foundation to help our country heal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
that you come in, you hear something, you leave kind of empty, right? And people are just rushing to come into church and rushing to go out of church. Something's wrong, right? So why are pastors not preaching and fixing that problem, right? Because sometimes they think, well, I mean, if I start being a little bit uh, uh, truthful out there, I might lose some memory, right? And it's not about gaining members. It's about winning souls. It's about going out there and preaching the word. Not only the pastors, everybody needs to preach the word, right? You need to share your testimony. You need to share what God did for you so you can have someone else a chance to right, receive Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. So we're going to preach about what what makes us lukewarm, right? And we're going we're gonna to go into uh, Revelations chapter 3. And we're going to look at uh, verse uh, 14, 15, and 16. This came out to the church, the seventh church of Asia, right? And this is God talking to them. And you can, and you're going to see. The, the word of God, right? There we go. So, God is preaching to the seventh church of Asia. And it was different churches back then, but it's still churches, real churches, right? Just like we have right now. There were different, they were dealing with different problems, but still, right? They were dealing with lukewarm problems, right? So, when I say lukewarm, it's that the church is, is experiencing some stuff that uh, it's never been seen before, but the last year, we kind of jumped like 50 years ahead of our time, right? The, pro the prophetic word kind of jumped 50 years. We went from one day to the other where we are totally being controlled, right? And being deceived, and they're, being, they're telling us one thing and one thing, the pastor say one thing, and the doctor say another thing, and you need to focus yourself in the word, right? When there's confusion, you have to go out there and read the scripture, right? The Bible right here is in the past, the present, and the future. Everything's right here. The mind is right here. The problem is that as Christians, we go home and we don't open the Bible. We're Christians, but some of these Bibles are collecting dust in here and there, right? We don't go and read it in the mornings and what does this mean, right? We don't really dig in deep into it, right? Which is, we are Christians, we believe in the Bible, the Bible's there. But when someone tells you, hey, you know what, this is what's happening right now, and you believe that person, then you go in and hearsay, right? You can't go in hearsay. You have to go into, is it a fact? So where do you get the facts? By studying, right? By going out there and reading the word, right? It's right there for you. And if you don't read it, then there's a the problem, right? So we're going to, as we go into the sermon, um, we're going to go into like seven different steps. Why we think that we are lukewarm, right? And one of them is when the first one's going to be when church is born, right? When we go on our, our daily work, we do our, our daily jobs, our families, right? And we have to do it, right? We have to go to work, go after our families, we have to pay our bills, and it's a routine. But then when we get to Sunday or whatever day you go to church, we're just like, oh, well, I'm tired. You know, it's like I start in the morning. Do we have to read either on time? Can we be a little later? And we start making excuses for why not going to church, right? So we already have a spirit of like, oh, well, you know, I work five days a week, I'm really tired, I'm not going to go to church. That's, that's a problem, right? We already be lukewarm by saying, church is boring. So why is church boring, you say? Well, it's because we don't read the Bible, right? We make it a chore. We go to church, and we don't even sit out in, in the church, and we're already thinking, where are we going to go eat, right? Uh, we got to take the people to the buffet. And we're not thinking of what the sermon's going to be. Sometimes we don't even read the Bible, right? In Bible lab, read it, take some notes, right? We make it a, a chore. We're here, we're present, we are offering to go home, right? That's bad. You're not going to grow like that as a Christian. You're basically just following the routine. You have to make church interesting, right? The Bible is interesting. You know, you have drama, romance, right? Wars. 
right? A little violence, you know, what are the book of Joshua, you know, it's a lot of killings there, right? So, but we don't go into it because we don't, we don't feel like reading it. We just want to hear the, the preacher preach whatever he has to preach. And sometimes there's some stuff that's been said that not really helping you to grow within the word, right? So don't make the church a chore. You have to go to Sunday, right? You want to make sure that you're excited to go to church, to meet your people in church, to help someone in need, right? To read the word, to pray, right? So we've got to make it exciting. When we don't do that, we start kind of deviating from what a Christian is supposed to be like. The second one is prayer. I believe that over the last years, our prayer services are kind of powerless. You know, the, the, the power in prayer is amazing, right? But when we have a Wednesday service, a, a prayer service, we come in here and if, if we're preaching, you know, if we're praying about five or six minutes, what's going on? We're always trying to be like, oh my gosh, you know, five minutes of prayer, you know, I don't know what to say no more, I gotta go to work, you know, thinking about, you know, what's tomorrow gonna be. Well, you know, prayer is about communication with God, right? To bring you brokenness, to say, nobody's perfect here. And you go to church and everybody's doing great and fantastic. And we're just like, no, no, you're supposed to be about brokenness and people that need help. Everybody has is dealing with different situations at home, right? You have a divorce, your kids are not doing well. Uh, you lost your job. You know, everybody has a situation where you don't want to say it because you don't want to be embarrassed or you don't want to put your things out there. But the truth is for you to come here so we can pray for you, so people can surround you and help you, right? So when we do a prayer service, we just think that praying for 10 minutes is too much. We start wondering, our, our minds just start wondering. And, you know, I've been to other countries where, you know, they put us to shame because they're praying for three or four hours, non-stop, you know? And, and you, you see, like, what's going on with our church, right? Well, we have the freedom to come here and worship the Lord. And you have people in China, the underground church in China, right, which they can carry a Bible. They have to memorize pages of the Bible and learn it and pass it on. You know, and those are genuine Christians, hardcore Christians that put us to shame because we have, we become... Complacent, like, oh, you know, we got everything, we can go to church next week, we can go to church. But, you know, you can't do that. You can't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow's for the devil, right? It's today that you have to do. You have to make a change in your life, right? So, when a prayer server comes, you have to pray. You have to pray, what's wrong with you, right? You have to pray. If you have to pray for 10 to 15 minutes, God's answering those prayers. God's listening to those prayers, right? We go to the restaurant and I see people sometimes in the restaurants, they're, they're praying, they're like, hey, if I can just me, just me. Because they're like afraid of people, you know, they're going to call them a Jesus freak because they're praying for their meal, right? Why? Why can't we go to a restaurant and pray loudly? Thank you, Lord, for this meal. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for everything you have done for me. Because they're going to think you're, what, you're crazy? Well, yeah, I want to be crazy for Jesus. Absolutely. And if they call me, well, that guy is crazy, I'll, I'll be crazy for him. Because you shouldn't be ashamed of praying in public, right? The best prayers are in private, right? Because you don't have to show off your prayer. But you, it's a communication. It's nothing that you have to practice in routine. It's just a, a, a conversation with God. Hey, Lord, I'm not doing well today. I'm just being a regular man. And I'm just having different talks and stuff. Just talk to him, right? We don't have to do it like every father thinking to say, you know, just talk to him. He'll listen to you. But when you have to break that barrier down and open up to him and preach to him, right, and tell him, I need your help, that's when you're really praying. So don't be afraid of praying, but we have to change that. How do we change it? One by one. We have to learn how to play and pray. We have to know how to be patient and praying with patience, right? Can I get an amen on that one? Yeah. Amen. There you go. Reading the Bible, studying the Word, discover, right? New things. You can, I mean, the devil knows the Bible from end to the, from beginning to end. Better than us, right? But he's lost. He's not getting into heaven, right? But when you read the word, sometimes you read the same passage and it means something different the following day, right? Because you're just praying over it. And I'm like, man, I've read this passage a thousand times and now it's just telling you something different. It's because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit just talks to you in a way that you understand, right? Nobody here, you can have three or four years of seminary, you can have a doctorate in theology, you understand that. But if you don't put it to practice, if you
are not humble enough to accept it and say, hey, you know what? I need to read the Bible more. Take some time with God, right? You have to have private time, get up in the mornings and just pray, read the word, and fill yourself with that spirit, right? And I can promise you, little by little, you're changing. You're going to start changing. You're going to start changing. Because you're putting things to work. You're learning, right? You're asking. I mean, remember 20 years ago, there wasn't no Google. There wasn't no none of that stuff, right? Right now, you have no excuses, right? Because right now, if you don't understand what that passage said, you can Google it. You can get more answers, right? But we don't even do that. Now, we go to work, and we do everything for work. Right? Left and right, we follow policies, procedures, you know, everybody has different things. We do like above and beyond because we want to get a raise, we want to get promoted, and we want to go above and beyond for the world, right? But when we come to God, we're like, oh, I'm going to cruise right here, right? God's got me. Well, it doesn't work that way. You have to put your work into it, right? You have faith, but if you don't make that first step, it's not going to be blessed, right? You can say, well, God, I need money, right? Well, money's not going to drop from heaven, right? You have to put to work, right? <laughs> but, you know, we have to make sure that we put it to work, right? Number number four, when giving is a hassle, right? So if you think you're a giver, right, and you have a problem tithing, you're not a giver. That's what my dad always told me. Look, if you don't know how to tie, you don't even know responsible how to tie, you're not a giver, right? You, you're in training wheels of giving, right? You have to, first of all, everything is God's. Your work, your life, whatever you do, he's giving you everything, right? He only asks for 10% of your tithe because it's, it's, it's to honor, right? To test them. He says, test me on this. You will get double, right? So when we are givers, we have to be really givers. Not only in your time. People think, watch well, God, you're about 10%. Like, whatever, you, you should be giving it 100%. But just giving your your all, meaning your time, too. You know, what's 10% of a week, right? You know, we have so many hours in a week. What's 10% of it? Do we give 10%? Do we give 20 hours to God a week? I don't know. Who does, right? I mean, are we in schedule on that? We're not. So 10% means you give 10% of your time, of your, of, your, your, of your listening, of your prayer, of your helping others. It's 10% of, entire, of your entire life, right? But we don't. We just think that tithing is just a, a hassle, right? Giving is just a hassle. When you give with an open heart, God will return that on you. Like my wife and I have been just pouring out. You know, into the church and say, we're just going to give, we're just going to give, we're going to keep moving, we're going to keep moving. God will provide. And it has not failed at all. I mean, our mouth is dropped sometimes because we're like, wow, you know? And we're going to go like, we're going to try to out give God. And it's not going to happen, but we're going to give it because it's not ours. We're going to give everything our time, our money, our, you know, our, our, our prayers, time. We're going we're to give it to Him. You know why? Because that's, that's our life right now. Right now, we have to give it to God. The world is in a turmoil right now. Okay, and you've got different directions, right? Okay, politicians, pastors, non-believers. It's, it's a whole mess, right? But as genuine Christians, we have to remain strong in our faith, right? That's what I think. Number five, we're going to, where rebellion or disobedience is a habit in our lives, Right? So we can be rebellions, right? Kids can be rebellious to the parents, right? We can rebel a little bit on different things, right? We can be stubborn sometimes. But when we make that a constant habit to be rebellious, that's not good, right? Because the Bible says that rebellious is like witchcraft. That's some strong words right there, right? I mean, witchcraft, rebellious. Yeah, if you maintain yourself in a rebellious status on anything, that's not good. You're not going to grow. You stop. You're not listening. You're not preaching, right? So we come to a point where we have our doubts and our stubbornness, but you have to move on from it. You have to come to peace. You have to pray your way, but you have to just stop at some point and say, God, forgive me, you know, I did this, I, I should have done that, I have to be more patient in all that with our kids, with our family, with our husband, with our wife. 
But you have to move on from that. You have to be that bigger person. You have to make that step and ask for forgiveness and say, I'm not going to stay on that status of rebellion. I have to move on from that, right? And most of the times, how many of us don't do that? You know, if somebody does you wrong at work or a friend or family, and you just have it right here. Like, oh, man, you know, when I see her next time, when I see him next time, you'll see, you know. And, it, and you keep it for weeks. Why? It's not going to help anything, right? You have to be the bigger person. You have to have the question. You have to say, you know what? It was done wrong to me, but it's okay. You know, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to give it away and move on, right? Because that status of rebellion is not good for your health. It's not good for your spirit. It's not good for anybody around your life and your family. You're just going to keep hitting that wall. Keep hitting that wall. We don't want to do that. Point number six. We stop sharing our faith. When is the last time, and don't raise hands, but I want to embarrass you, but when is the last time you talked to someone about Jesus Christ and you brought them to, to know Jesus, right? To accept them as their personal Savior. When, when's the last time we, we've done that? When, the, when God said, you know, go to the world, go to the end of the world and preach and tell them about me, right? I know people that have been the entire years, they go to church and they've never spoken to them. They have friends, neighbors, and they don't talk about Jesus. Well, why do we do that? It's not only the pastor, you know, tasked to talk about salvation, it's all of us. We all are ministers. We all have to, have to minister and talk about Jesus Christ, right? But in the workplace, we do it. I've done it. People have done it. Because you know what? There's some people out there that are lost. They could be friends, family, uh, people that you know in your neighborhood. But they could be lost. So meaning that we know they're probably lost, and we don't care. If they're lost, they're going to go to hell. And we just walk around, and we don't care about it, right? So we need to change that. This is, we need to talk about Jesus Christ. We need to, how, how do we change if you don't talk to them? Well, pastor, I don't know the Bible like you do. Well, nobody's perfect in the Bible. You know, if you don't, if you don't read it, if you don't study it, you're going to have, you're going to stumble because if you don't know how to go in the circles of the Bible, you're not going to be able to share. But you're thinking too much about how to share your faith. All you have to do is say, look, I was down, I was broken. Jesus came into my life, changed me completely. Little by little, it, it was just a new me. And, and just give me your testimony. That's all you have to do. You're just planting a seed. You know, when you do that, believe it or not, little by little, that person is going to change because you just planted a seed. Because some people are looking for an escape route, right? They're looking for hope. And when nobody has spoken to them about Jesus Christ and their salvation, then, you know, who will? So when you do that, and you share your testimony, you're ministering, you're preaching, and that's what you need to do, right? So we need to start changing the way we go to church. You need to talk to your neighbor, talk to your friend, talk to your co-worker, because you know what? You're probably the less resource connection for them to learn about Christ, right? Wouldn't it be great to just, you know, bring somebody to Christ every day? That means that person's going to heaven eternally, right? So we need to, not only me, we all need to share the word in our schools, and in our homes, and our families, right? Let's jump into the last one. When routine has invaded our lives, who has it fallen into routine? All of us, right? I've fallen into routine a bunch of times, and as a pastor son and a ministry son, sometimes it gets repetitive what we do in the Word. And um, I can think of times where you know my dad needed me to go here and there and help him in the church and help him visiting people and help him translate this and translate that. And, and it was it, it got to be a routine. It got to be a job, right? And you start seeing people as you know I got to do this, I got to do that, and and. and and then you have to slow down a little bit and say, hold on a second. You know, church is not about making it a routine. It's about meeting new people, connecting with new people. It's about helping their lives. People are struggling left and right. Last year was a mess, right? 
and in some states is still a mess, right? We're, we're lucky we live in Texas, you know, and Floridians as well, but some states, and they're still in lockdowns. Some states, churches are, are closed completely. Some pastors are going to jail. They're getting fines in California. So, you know, we don't have it as bad here, but imagine the people up north. They can't even congregate, right? So when we make it a routine, that's what happens in the world. And I think the churches have failed the people last year. Um, yes, the pandemic came and, and, and COVID came and you know everybody has different opinions about different things. But at some point in life, three or four months after it came, you have to wake up and say, okay, we can close the churches. Churches do stay open, right? Because you go to church and what happens? People don't have the, the place of hope. You know, what's going on in their house? Well, there could be domestic violence, suicide, drug addiction, right? And the church was the only resource to get out of that. So when you close that resource, what happens? There's no hope, right? People are dying. We don't know statistics. We only hear what we hear in the news, but, you know, terrible things happened last year. And we can't allow that to happen anymore. We need to change ourselves, right? We need to make sure that we do things differently. We need to not fear, right? The problem right now is fear. Uh, you enter a store, do I wear a mask? Do I wear a mask? You know, you're all confused, right? It's like, well, which side do we choose? And it's like, well, they're playing with you. You know, they're, they want to see who is the people that are complying and who will be the problem, right? And we went to the, the mall the other day with my wife and we had to get something from there. And you know, it's like, we're the only one not wearing a mask. And we're like, wow, you know, I know that some people are scared, and I understand that. I'm not scared. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He's my God. He protects me. He's not going to let me die for that. It's your faith that keeps you healthy and saves you, right? So you can't, you can't have a weak God. We don't have a weak God. You know, if we think that COVID, our God stopped at COVID, then what kind of God do we have? Right? The, the God that rose the dead, that healed the blind, right? I mean, we have to stop fearing. But when you walk out there, you see people. And they're like, wow, the whole world is, is, is infected with fear. And now, like, if you go two years ago to a bank with a mask, you probably get arrested, right? Now you go to the bank without a mask, you probably get arrested. So everything's flipped. Everything's flipped. And we're like, what, what's going on with that? So when you want answers, you're not going to get it from the news. You're not going to get it from the neighbor that's angry at the church or the neighbor's angry at the world, right? You're not going to get it from a politician. You're going to get it from the word. I mean, you have to have your faith in God, right? Not a rig, not anything in here. You have to walk your faith with our Lord, right? We can't just say, well, you know, God will take care of it. This will pass. Who do you think? If you think these things are passing, you are not paying attention. Okay? If you think that everything's going to get better, mm, no, we're in the last years. You have to wake up right now. We're not, and it's not going to get better next year. Okay? I mean, the bad people is taking over, right? And what are they doing? They're trying to shut every church. Why do you want to? Why, why did they want to shut the church? Why the church? Right? Because the strip club was open. Walmart's open. Everything else is open. They're not keeping distancing. Right? You go to Walmart, take your mask on, nobody tells you anything anymore. So it, everything, there's no rules. But church, you can't come in. You can't sing. I mean, you have to, at some point, we have to return to common sense. You're all grown adults. If you read the word, you can make decisions on your own. This is when my dad came to this country. It's a free country, founded on a Judeo-Christian, under God. He, the money has in God we trust, right? That's why this country is blessed. But when the devil wants to do something bad, he's not going to go and hurt the bad people. He's going to take the church down, right? That's what the hope is, the church. That's what salvation is, the church. The devil's lost. He's not going to heaven, but he doesn't want anybody else to go into heaven. So let's put the church down. Again, we're, we're, we're blessed that we're in Texas, right? We have a, a conservative, you know, governor, but some states are not happy. I have a lot of people on live streaming, you know, saying, you know, you guys lucky that you're going to church. We haven't gone to church in a year. Are you kidding me? 
And I tell people, you know, we need to stop talking about politicians and politicians. You know, I've been to countries where politicians are bad, right? They're not, they're not bad right here. They're lightweight compared to going to Cuba, Venezuela. Yeah, they're horrible. You can't do anything over there. You have no rights at all. We have rights here, right? You just have to have common sense and start making adult decisions, right? Not a reckless decision, but I have no fear. My family has no fear of this. But you have to get to there. How? By prayer. By trying. Have faith. Step into that, right? What are you going to lose? I know that our faith is stronger. Our God is, he still sits on the throne. You know, he, he's alive. But he lets things happen so you can grow in it. He'll throw some curveballs, but you have to start listening to men. That's why, you know, our church might be founded on that, uh, that um, chapter, Acts on 529, which says, we ought to obey God rather than men. And these are the times, right? Because right now, if you obey man, the man who rules right now is going everything against God, right? Everything that they're putting out there in this administration is against God. All God's rules. Right? So when those rules start conflicting with God's rules, that's when that verse comes up. We have to obey God rather than men. Right? Because when you know they're putting stuff out there about this uh, blasphemy and ungodly, right? Why? Because they want to destroy this country. You can't allow that to happen. The churches need to stand up. The churches need to preach the word of God. I don't think we have a politician problem. I think we have a church problem, right? The churches, 95% of the churches closed down last year, right? The only ones open have a bunch of restrictions on it. Nobody wants to go to church no more. Because why would you have, like if I were to put a sign out there, you have to wear a mask, I wouldn't be preaching. Because then the house of the Lord is weak. You're going to come here and get sick. You're going to die. No, that's not the God we serve. The God we serve is almighty and powerful. He, he's he's going he's gonna to heal. He's going to heal your family. But you have to step in into that faith. He's not going to act on it without faith. When he walked the earth, and you had this woman crawl onto him and just touch him, and she was thinking, if I can touch him, I can get healed. That was the faith. And she got healed. Right? She didn't ask anything. She didn't pray for anything. She knew if he can touch his world, she's going to be healed. We don't have that faith right now. We're doubting. We're like, oh, I think I'm going to die again. Stop fearing. Make good decisions. Learn the word. Stay in prayer. Stop being lukewarm. Right? So if we read the first chapter right here, I'm going to end with this. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right, these things say that I'm in the faithful and the true witness, the beginning in the uh, in the creation of God. So he's talking about to the angel, he's talking about the pastors of the church. Okay? He's talking to the pastors of the church when he says to the angels of the church. So can you change to 15, please? I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So what does that mean? He's saying to them is saying that I know that you are not hot or cold because they were in the middle. They were confusing people, right? So he's asking them, this is the way I see you, but I wish you can pick a side. What are you? Are you blazing hot or you're freezing cold? You can't be in the middle, right? So they were confusing the churches. So this is God talking to the pastors of the church, right? Different churches back then, same problems. Same problems right now. Right now, the churches are lukewarm. You go to every parking lot of big churches out here in North Texas, they're half empty. 50% of the members are not coming back to church. Why? Because the pastor failed. The pastor goes to church. And I told these pastors shouldn't pastor no more. You know, by the second month, they should open their church and stop following guidance from the state because the state and the church doesn't mix. Right? This one the church says, okay, you know what? I'm going to pastor. I'm going to preach. Whoever wants to come, you're free to come. But you don't close the door to the church and say, well, you know what? We better close because we're going to kill half of America if we're open. Who are you? You're not God. God 
God put you in there to preach to your flock. You are hold accountable to your flock. And if you say, like, I don't care about you guys, I'm going to go to church, then what happened to the flock? Where's the leader? Right? And that's when I told some of these pastors are cowards. Some of these pastors are pumpkin pastors. They like their shows, they like their, their fog lights and their stage, and everything is time, and, and they go home, and, and what, what did you get out of that? A what I know service about some movie that they were referring to. Listen, why don't we preach from the Word of God right here? So, this next chapter, this is what God tells you. And I'm like, God, I, 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 me and God would have been like best pals. I'll tell you that right now because I'm a very bold guy. And I'm keeping it light right now because I don't want this to shut me down soon. But um, it says, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. That's God telling the church pastor. Back then. It's not Rick. It's not any of you guys saying anything. It's God telling you, because you're not either hot or cold, I will throw you up out of my mouth. Man, if God's telling you then you better be paying attention. Right? Because you're doing something wrong. Pick this up. I think last year, the line is drawn in sin. I don't think this is a politician thing. Listen, politicians can say whatever they want to say, right? Trump's not going to be your savior. Biden's not going to be your savior. When you die without Christ, you're going to be held accountable by the same God that I believe in. You believe it or not, you're either going to be with entrance to the kingdom of God, you're going to be denied entrance and thrown to the lake of fire. It's as simple as that. I'm not going to, you know, water it down with you. There's a heaven and there's a hell. He's giving you a free will to accept him or to deny him. But you cannot accept the God that sometimes he's strong and sometimes he's weak. God is almighty, all powerful. He knows everything. He knows every hair count in your head. Okay? So that's powerful. So you need to make sure that we stop living this lukewarm, fearful life. You, we're all grown-ups. We have to say, this is tough right now. Stop listening to your name, say your friends. You know, listen. Some of my friends on Facebook have been like, my goodness, they don't like what I say, they don't like what I put, I'm very verbal when it comes to politics and in church. Well, you can't really, Pastor Rick, you can't really talk about politics in the, in the church. I'm like, who said that? And they don't know, they, don't, they can't respond. But who said that? Just because pastors everywhere in the world don't want to preach about politics doesn't mean you can't. The Bible is full of politics, right? Jesus Christ, a common man, was crucified by who? By the government, by the people, the Pharisees. There's politics in everywhere. You, you can't preach and support a politician, but you can preach about biblical values. And that's what pastors don't do anymore, right? They, they have Democrats, Republicans, independents. They don't want to get anybody ticked off. So I'm going to say something really loud so I can keep my church growing. And that's not what a church is about. Church of God is saying, listen, if I don't preach you the right stuff, and you don't listen to the right stuff in the Word of God, then you're kind of leading them the wrong way. You can't. We have to stop that, right? So my dad was always a bold preacher. And my dad always told me, oh, listen, Rick, if you are not offending your congregation with your words, the Word of God, then you're not really a preacher. You're a people pleaser. And I'm not here to please anybody. I'm not in the, in, in the business of being liked, right? I'm in the business of making sure that you're getting it straight up from the word of God. Word by word, chapter by chapter, it's not what I say, it's what God says right here. He tells you if you lukewarm, he will throw you up by his mouth. That's pretty bad. Look, I respect someone that's going to go hot, even if disagree with God, but I respect that person more then somebody's no more. Right? You gotta choose a side. This is a a fight between evil and good. It's not about Republicans and Democrats. It's not about none of that stuff. It's evil versus good, right? Some people are trying to pass ridiculous stuff, right? To our children, transgender equity rights. They're trying to pass ridiculous stuff. That's blasphemy. That's against God's laws, right? And we're okay with that. No, pastors shouldn't be okay with none of that nonsense. But they don't want to say anything because they, you know, they don't want to lose their 501, 501c3, 
Who cares about that? We're preaching the word of God, right? We're preaching salvation. So I think there's a church problem. I think the, the church needs to wake up. And how do you wake up the church? By waking up the pastors. If the pastor stands up and starts preaching the, the true word of God, then the church is going to stand up. If the pastor cowers down and doesn't do anything, then you're going to have the same watered down service, a bunch of newborn people, and they're going to have a bunch of fear going everywhere. And that's not what we need to do. We need to preach the word of God, salvation, right? And we can't do that if we continue preaching the same nonsense, right? I'm not here to place any fear with you guys. Everybody's going through problems right now. If you tell me you're not going through problems, you're a liar, right? Right? We're all going through different kind of problems in our lives. But God is there for you, to guide you, to help you, to support you, to heal you from anything. But when we come to our senses, we don't think that he can do that. Well, what kind of God do you believe in? Because the, the kind of God that I believe in, he's almighty, right? I can have anybody around me. I'm not going to get sick of anything, right? I'm going to keep preaching the right word of God. And I'm going to keep saying what I need to say. And I'm not going to be the regular pastor that wants to go, like, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, get people mad. I don't want to get into problems, you know. Yeah, I want to get into problems. I want to get people mad. Because you know what? If we don't do it, then where are you going to get the truth from, right? It's not what Rick said. It's what the, the God says right here, right? So we're going to close down. And I just ask for you guys that go home. In order to do different things in life, you have to achieve different results. You have to do different things. You can't keep living the same life and accept the same results, right? I know it's hard sometimes because we have husbands and, and wives, and sometimes, you know, we don't connect as much, and you believe here, I believe that. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be held accountable by me or your husband or your wives. You know, when this life is over and you take your last breath, you're going to be held accountable by God. You're going to be face-to-face -face with the maker, right? So what do you do now, from now on, by following Christ, reading the Bible, getting to prayer, help others, go to church, excited to go to church, be a cheerful giver, right? Ask questions. Nobody asks questions no more, right? They listen one thing, they go home confused, they don't ask anything, right? Ask questions. We're here to help each other. That's the, that's the problem with churches. You go to church... There's 3,000 people in church. Nobody knows who you are. You come, you sit, you leave, and that's it. Right? No, a, a church is a community of people. God says to congregate, to help each other, to get to know each other, to support each other. And that's what we don't see in churches anymore. But some churches are doing that, but not all of them. Most of them are just wandering around. They just, oh, let's reconnect. You know, on Easter, Sunday, I got a bunch of stuff on my Facebook app. Hey, let's reconnect. We've been close for six months. Let's reconnect. Where have you been in six months? What do you mean you're reconnecting? When did you stop connecting with people? Right? It doesn't make any sense to me that a pastor will say, hey, we have to close. We're reconnecting again. So where's your members? Where do they go? No. That's wrong. You can never stop connecting with the people that you're helping. Right? Online is not the same. The Bible doesn't say connect online. The Bible says congregate, meaning congregate inside, right? You're not going to kill anyone. Pastor Brent Glock out there, you know, in Tennessee, he's got 10 to 1,100 people. He didn't kill anybody yet, right? It's your faith. You have to stop believing the lie. You have to stop living your lives because people haven't got it. Live your life. You will be okay. Trust in the Lord. The Lord will heal you, will, will take care of you, will protect you. Once you move, that step forward, then things start getting clear. That's how we do it my wife. When we start making that step forward, everything starts happening. So I ask you that change your life little by little. And start praying. And start talking to God. Start reaching out to your neighbor. Start reaching out to the church. Start living differently. Right? If I can have Mason, if I can have Mason come here and um, lead us into music and I'm going to ask if um, anybody has never had the 
the opportunity to know Christ, right? There's one, one way to the Father, through the Son, who died on the cross for our sins. When he died 2,000 years ago, he died for my sins right now. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. We all fall short to the glory of God. All of us. Every day. But because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we repent. We try to do better. Right? But sometimes our family members and our friends don't see it that way. Right? And you're the crazy one. Well, I'll tell you something. I am crazy. I'm crazy for Jesus. I'm a Jesus freak. I'm not a devil freak. Right? My wife knows me. You know, I'm, I can get out there. Right? And I'm trying to keep it down a little bit. But we can't be lukewarm anymore. I've seen people just stop living. No vacations. Haven't seen their parents for a year. What are you doing? That mask? It's just a gag order. Shut up. Get away from your parents. Right? Your parents have wisdom. Remember, your parents have wisdom. Right? You, you go away from wisdom. Right? That's not good. At some point, we have to understand that that stuff doesn't work. All right? Unless you're wearing an astronaut hat or a, a, a great level military mask, those little things are going to cause some violence. It doesn't work. Right? But you know, I go to work and I have to wear one. Right? But I tell you, make your decisions on your own. Stop fearing life. Do you really want to continue living life in fear? Because they can drive this for years. Right? You think it's going to stop tomorrow? It's not going to stop tomorrow. They're gonna put more stuff and passports and vaccines. And they're gonna keep. They're gonna keep working the people. That's how the devil is. Trying to attack you and destroy you and just make you weak until you done. No, just live with Christ. Have faith. Move forward. Push forward. Help your friend. Help your neighbor. But if you never know Jesus Christ, if you die right now, today's your last day on earth. Do you know where you're gonna go? I know where I'm going to go. I think my last breath, this will die right here, but I will be in heaven. Your soul never dies. That's two places. Heaven or hell. And unfortunately, God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. You send yourself to hell. Why? Because you denied him. It's very simple. He sent his son to die on the cross, an awful death for your sins. And you denied that. Well, I can tell you that I don't deny him. I think he it's amazing that he didn't cower down, knowing that he was going to die on the cross. He didn't cower. Knowing that he was going to die crazy. He didn't cower. He still did it. Right? For us. And here we are, afraid of what people say. Turn your life around. Get in prayer. Get stronger. Reach out to your family and your friends. Stop that fear. Live your life. You don't know. I know what I have on my bank account. Most of you guys know what we have in your bank account, right? But you don't know how much time we have. Today to be, be my last day. But I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Right? So how do you know? Well, you accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Says the only way to the Father is through the Son. If you recognize that He died on the cross, for your sins, and you accept him as your personal Savior, and you welcome him into your heart, saying, I want to I wanna get to know you, he will make you a new man, a new woman. You're born again. And you start changing, right? So with your eyes bow down, I'm going to ask you, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. We're not here to embarrass anybody, but I want to make sure that you have peace in your heart that if something will happen to you, then you don't go to a bad place. Because you don't want to go to hell. There's no, there's no coming back out of that. It's a very bad place. Burning, warms, horrible, eternally. It's not a joke. A lot of people die without Christ. And they wake up in a really bad place. So if you think that you don't have to discuss your personal Savior and you want to say, hey, you know what, I want to talk to you after uh, the church or you want to come up front or we'll pray right there in your seat with your heads bowed, just raise your hand. Tell me, you know what, Rick? 
I don't want to go to hell. I don't know what this all, this is all about, but I know that the only way to heaven is through the Son. And if I can accept Him, if I die without Him, I deny Him, and I'll be denied entrance into heaven. So if there's anybody in here that wants to take that commitment and say, you know what, I want to know Christ. I want to be a newborn man. I want to change my life around. And I want to be a, a better person. I want to be saved, first of all. But I want to change. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just raise your hand and say, hey, you know what? I want to know Christ. Maybe this is your last chance. Maybe you don't get a last, next chance tomorrow. Maybe this is it. Right? Because God knows your heart. So if you think you want to, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. I can pray for you privately as well. Um, if not, just bear with me as I'll lead you into a prayer of salvation and you can do it from your seat. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for that gift, that free gift of life, eternal life in heaven. Lord, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Change my life around. Make me a new man, a new woman. Change my life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to dismiss you guys. You're dismissed. Thank you for attending. It was awesome. We're going to continue doing it next Sunday, 5 to 8. And there was a lot of people that get to join us today, but they'll come in next Sunday. Um, I promise you that, you know, I'll, I'll keep it light, but there will be some times where, you know, it's full, full court, right? We have to beat this nonsense, you know, this tyrannical government is just shutting everything down, and we can't allow that. We fight for our God. This is a free country. We are free men, free women. We have the right uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. We have to bear arms. We have to protect our churches and our people. Uh, we're going to stay a little bit until about 7.45. If anybody has any prayer, any requests, you know, my wife and I and others will, you know, will pray with you. We want to pray with you. Any, anybody in the family that's, that's sick or uh, some events, we'll pray with you right here. So we'll, we'll do a small groups after right now, and then we'll, we'll just stay in prayer in, uh, in communion, okay? All right, you're dismissed. Thank you.